Occupational English test. Practice test one. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear an obstetrician talking to a patient called Melissa Gordon. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. So this first meeting, Mrs. Gordon, is mainly a chance for you and I to get to know each other.、Uh, I'll ask about your medical history, and this is also an opportunity for you to ask me any questions that you've got at this point. Sure.、Uh, so some background. What kind of work do you do? I have a job at an engineering company. I'm a computer programmer. I currently do four days a week, but I hope to reduce that to three after my maternity leave. Ah, excellent. So tell me about your medical health. Do you have any conditions I should know about? Well,、uh, I have asthma attacks, but they don't happen often. I lost about ten kilos, and that certainly helped. I have an inhaler, but、I、hardly ever use it. Oh, I should also let you know that I come out in terrible hives if I take penicillin, but、mm. not other things. I'm, I'm fine if I eat nuts, for example.、Uh -huh. I have a fairly healthy lifestyle. I'm a vegetarian, and I've never smoked. Good.、Uh, I'm afraid I don't go to the gym or anything, but I walk to work and、uh, generally keep active. Oh, that's good. So this is your first pregnancy?、Uh, no, I have a daughter called Ella. She's three now. Ah, and did everything go smoothly that time?、Uh, there were no major problems during the pregnancy itself, but it took me quite a time to fall pregnant the first time. After having various tests, I was given some fertility drugs. Oh, what were they called? It's on the tip of my tongue.、Um, oh, never mind. It'll come back to me. This time, though, I didn't need any help.、Oh, it's no problem. What about labour last time round? Oh, that was a nightmare. Though everything, thank goodness, worked out in the end. It was a breech birth. It looked as if I might have to have a cesarean, and I really didn't want that. I was pleased I managed without an epidural too. They had to use forceps to get Ella out, but I didn't need any stitches, so that was okay.、Mm. Unfortunately, though, I had some difficulties after the birth too. I was desperate to start breastfeeding, but that didn't work out. At least not until I was given some guidance by the midwife. Okay. So, can I ask you about the baby's father?、Uh, sure. That's my husband, Paul.、Uh, there's something in his family history that I should tell you about. I think uh, uh -huh. his、uh, grandfather and father both had epilepsy, though he hasn't developed it himself.、Uh -huh. I'm not sure if that means his children have a greater chance of having it or not. Oh, also, he has a child from his first marriage, and she has Down syndrome, so he gets a bit anxious when I'm pregnant. Oh, well, that's understandable, of course. We can discuss various testing options if you like.、Uh, you might want to consider amniocentesis, for example.、Mm, but that carries a risk of miscarriage, doesn't it? I, I don't want to go for that. I've heard about another test called、uh, CVS. Is is that something to consider? Well, it's certainly an option. However, that procedure, in fact, also carries a small increase in the risk of miscarriage,、oh. and you'd need to come to a decision fairly soon because it's normally carried out between weeks ten and twelve of the pregnancy. 
Well, I can tell you straight away that if there's more risk, then I wouldn't consider it. I know my husband will feel the same. Well, that's fair enough. So, is there anything else you'd like to ask me about today? Um, nothing urgent. But it'd be good to know more about how to get siblings ready for a new addition to the family. Uh-huh. I-, I want to make sure Ella doesn't feel threatened or replaced or anything. Well, there's a leaflet that many parents find helpful. Here we are. Have a look through that. Oh, thanks. That's great. I'm sure I'll have lots more questions at our next meeting. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a GP talking to a new patient called Mike Royce. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello? Coming in. You must be Mr Royce. I understand that you've just signed up with the practice. Yeah, that's right. Mike Royce. I've joined this practice because my previous GP retired and he suggested I come here. Right, and I understand you've got an ongoing medical condition you're worried about? Perhaps you'd like to start by telling me about that. How did it start? Well, I suppose it started out as a really strong pain in my left knee. In, um, I think it's called the, the medial meniscus. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Mm-hmm. It, it came on whenever I tried to bend the knee more than normal. Then I tripped while climbing some stairs at work, and that seemed to make things worse. I started to get these very tender bumps all over the back of the knee. Right. They were very painful, even just lightly touching them. The doctor called them trigger points. Yeah, that's right. They're called that because pain frequently radiates out from them when touched. And how did that affect you day to day? Well, I went back to work after a week or so, but I was still having knee problems. I couldn't really squat properly or climb ladders. That's important in my job. I'm a painter, you know, and I'm always having to get into awkward positions. Anyway, I kept going back to my old GP explaining that I still had severe pain whenever I tried to bend my knee. He gave me all these exercises to do and I tried doing them. I really did. I made sure I did gentle stretches before I did anything more energetic. Everything, really. I tried resting like he told me. I used ice packs when when it got sore. But nothing really worked. Right, I see. But then the doctor decided I might be suffering from tendonitis. So he sent me for some rehab work in the hospital. That actually did seem to work, at least at first. But I'm guessing not for long. Right. The problem came back. I kept telling the doctor that my knee still wasn't healed, but it was actually my physiotherapist in the hospital rather than my old GP who noticed that something was wrong with my muscles. He wouldn't say what it was, but I knew something was up. He was doing myofascial release on my hamstrings, and I was in agony. Right, so did did you go back to your GP? I did, but he didn't know what I should do about it, so I left feeling completely fed up. That's one of the reasons I decided to come here. Okay. I just feel like nobody's taking this seriously. I think it's affected my life in lots of other ways too. The worry's given me insomnia, for one thing. Mm. I don't think I have actual depression, but I certainly suffer from constant anxiety about when it's going to flare up. Is there anything that you're particularly worried you might have? Well, I've researched this pain I'm getting. Um, To be honest, I'm convinced I've got fibromyalgia, not just some simple muscle problem, because I fit most of the symptoms, and I've had pain absolutely everywhere. Look, I've even kept a a pain diary so that I could track what I did that set it off. You know, the the weather, if I was working or not, where it was affecting me, what it felt like. Oh, good. I, I figured out from this that it's usually in the same places that I mentioned earlier, plus some newish places too my shoulders and elbows, and I know that my knee's actually one of the more tender points for it. What do you think? 
Look, I must say from what you've told me so far that I'm concerned enough to look into that possibility. So as a next step, we need to get you seen by a rheumatologist. This is a notoriously difficult condition to diagnose, as I'm sure you're aware, because so many of the symptoms overlap with other conditions too. I won't be happy to be proved right, but I'll certainly be glad to get some answers at long last. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a dietitian talking to a patient. Now read the question. So what seems to be the problem? I feel such a failure. I'm sure people think that if I just tried harder, I could lose weight. Maybe I need more willpower. Well, firstly, well done for seeking medical help. Actually, being overweight or obese is a medical problem, because being overweight changes how your body works. Oh, thanks, but I do feel that it's my fault for being this way. Well, I hear what you say, but please understand that these days we consider that obesity is a disease, <laughs> like high blood pressure or asthma. You see, the body's signals to the brain stop working correctly when you're overweight, and with time you feel less full, even if you eat the same amount. And when you cut calories, your body tries to use less energy to keep your weight the same. Question 26. You hear members of a hospital committee discussing problems in the X-ray department. Now read the question. So next on the agenda is the problems in the x-ray department. Nick, would you like to fill us in here? Well, as you all know, this is a very busy department. Uh, so we have four x-ray machines in all, including one in the fracture and orthopedic clinic area. But recently, one of the other x-ray machines developed a fault. And so we had to apply for authorization for the purchase of a new tube for it. There's been some kind of hold up with the paperwork, and while we've been waiting, patients are being brought into the fracture and orthopedic area for x-rays there instead, and of course that's causing further congestion. Question 27. You hear a senior nurse giving feedback to a trainee after a training exercise. Now read the question. OK, that went quite well, didn't it? But it took you a while to work out where the CPR board was kept. Yeah. So what does that tell you about this scenario? We need to check where things are before doing anything else. Exactly. And, of course, it takes a second or two to put the head of the bed down because you've got to have that part of the bed flat before you slip the board in. I wish there was a quicker way. So do I put the CPR board under or would I normally hand it over to somebody else? It makes no difference as long as it's done. Question 28. 
you hear a trainee nurse asking his senior colleague about the use of anti-embolism socks for a patient. Now read the question. I noticed that Mrs Jones isn't wearing the usual anti-embolism socks, but I didn't want to ask her why not, because she was asleep. Is it because her legs are swollen? Well, sometimes we don't recommend the socks if there's severe swelling with edema, but that's not the case here. Mrs Jones was actually given them initially on admission last night, but she told us this morning that her lower legs were feeling numb. She described it as having no feeling. Until we've checked out the reason for that, for example, it could be an underlying condition which could damage her arterial circulation. We're reducing the risk of thrombosis by pharmacological means. Oh, I see. Question 29. You hear a vet talking about her involvement in the management of the practice where she works. Now read the question. At first, when I took over the financial running of the practice, I felt rather thrown in at the deep end. I really needed to know my stuff and be super organised especially with the number of new drugs and treatments available now, all of which have to be very carefully costed. It keeps me super busy, but monitoring stocks and so on helps give me confidence and allows me to see how everything fits into the overall picture of working as a vet. My manager's more than happy to leave me to run this side of things. He's in overall charge, of course, but I can always go to him if there's a problem. I keep him closely informed of what's happening. He's always pleased if I manage to make savings anywhere. Question 30. You hear a physiotherapist giving a presentation about a study she's been involved in. Now read the question. I'm a physiotherapist, and I'm presenting our poster about constraint-induced movement therapy for children suffering from partial paralysis following brain surgery. We did a case series of four children who'd all undergone hemispherectomies. They were admitted to inpatient therapy within two weeks post-op and began therapy two to three weeks post-op. The therapy continued after they were discharged. Our findings were that three of the kids regained excellent function and mobility with ambulation and upper extremity function. One didn't do so well, unfortunately, but he gave up the therapy early on. This type of movement therapy has been used a lot in adult populations following stroke. The findings here promote moving forward with further research on the pediatric or adolescent population following either hemispherectomy or other surgeries, to help us decide how appropriate this therapy would be for them. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. 
Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear a sports physiotherapist called Chris Maloney giving a presentation in which he describes treating a high jumper with a knee injury. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello, I'm Chris Maloney, a physiotherapist specialising in sports injuries, and I'd like to present a case study to give you an idea of the sort of work I do. It features a very successful high jumper in her mid-twenties who was referred to me with severe pain in her right knee, and that's the leg she takes off from when she jumps. What's more, when she stepped up her training in preparation for a big competition, the pain worsened and she'd been forced to pull out of the event. After that, she'd taken several months off training to rest and get treatment from various therapists. To her dismay, however, not only did the pain continue, it actually got worse, meaning she was unable to do any strength training, let alone jump-specific work. Uh, by the time I saw her, she was on the verge of giving up, having lost virtually all belief in her ability. My initial assessment quickly confirmed patella tendinitis in the affected knee, accompanied by some swelling and significant tenderness over the lower part of the kneecap. This wasn't difficult to diagnose. Uh, I also noted that she was slightly overweight for her height and had rather flat feet, but that's not so unusual in high jumpers. A further assessment revealed that the gluteal muscles connecting the hips and thighs were considerably less sturdy than you'd expect in an athlete of this calibre, and both the lateral retinaculum connecting the patella to the femur and the iliotibial band, the ligament running down the outside of the thigh, were tight and tender. As a first stage, I was keen to show I could help by relieving some of the pain, so I worked at loosening her lateral retinaculum to see how much of the tendon pain was due to inflammation and how much came from restriction of normal patella movement. This manipulation and massage instantly cleared the pain she'd felt while doing a single leg dip exercise, where you stand on one leg and bend the knee. This indicated that her tendon pain was most likely due to patellofemoral joint dysfunction caused by muscle imbalance and poor biomechanics and not by an active inflammatory process or partial tear in her patella tendon. So an MRI scan wasn't needed. The treatment continued along similar lines for some weeks uh, with loosening of the lateral retinaculum and deep tissue massage of the iliotibial band and other muscles. One option at this point was something called taping. This is a way of reducing pain so that athletes can continue with strength exercises. But it seemed clear from early on that we shouldn't put taping on this patient's patella and tendon until she started jumping again. 
She was getting pain relief and progress simply from the manual techniques, and taping might have led to problems later on. Athletes often become dependent on tape and, and other accessories. Um, in other words, instead of aiming for 100% muscle strength and joint position control, they settle for 80% plus artificial support. The patient also had a specially designed program of gym activities. Although she needed to restore power to those muscles affected by inflammation and tenderness, uh, the priority was to get her posture and alignment right. Uh, she started by doing double leg squats with her back to a wall in front of a mirror so that she could see whether her feet were arched and if her knees were over her feet. Uh, she also did squats while squeezing a ball between her knees. There was light leg press work, followed by single leg stance work, first static, then on wobble boards, and with elastic resistance. She progressed to moving on and off steps, sometimes holding weights, all the time paying close attention to positioning and muscle and joint alignment. The next stage was to liaise with the patient's coach. She began running, uh, jogging for stamina, and then sprint sessions. Work on power was stepped up gradually and included some weightlifting. After some analysis, we also decided to modify her, uh, her run-up to the high jump bar. By beginning from a wider position and running in with much less of a curve, there was much less of an impact on the ankle, knees and hip, especially in her right jumping leg. Interestingly, the patient reported that remodelling the run-up felt fresh and motivating and helped to reinforce the sense she had of being a reborn athlete. Once the rehabilitation process was complete, she was able to compete without pain and free of any reliance on taping or knee strapping. So, uh, before I go on to the next... Now look at Extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear a clinical psychiatrist called Dr Anthony Gibbons giving a presentation about the value of individual patients' experiences and stories in medicine. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, my name's Anthony Gibbons. I'm a clinical psychiatrist and published author. I'd like to talk about something that's relevant to all medical professionals, the use of narratives in medicine. Let me begin with a case study sent to me by a colleague who shares my interest in the subject. The study featured a 30-year-old man who was hospitalised for severe panic attacks. He was treated with narcoanalysis, but feeling no relief, turned to alcohol and endured years of depression and social isolation. 
Four decades later, he was back in the psychiatric system, but for the first time, he was prescribed the antidepressant Zoloft. Six weeks later, he was discharged because the panic attacks and depression had disappeared. He lived a full life until his death 19 years later. If the narrative was striking, it was even more so for its inclusion in a medical journal. Repeatedly, I've been surprised by the impact that even lightly sketched case histories can have on readers. In my first book, I wrote about personality and how it might change on medication. My second was concerned with theories of intimacy. Readers, however, often used the books for a different purpose, identifying depression. Regularly, I received and still receive phone calls, people saying, my husband's just like X, one figure from a clinical example. Other readers wrote to say that they'd recognised themselves. Seeing that they weren't alone gave them hope. Encouragement is another benefit of case description, familiar to us in an age when everyone's writing their biography. But this isn't to say that stories are a panacea to issues inherent in treating patients, and there can be disadvantages. Consider my experience prescribing Prozac. When certain patients reported feeling better than well after receiving it, I presented these examples first in essays for psychiatrists and then in my book, where I surrounded the narrative material with accounts of research. In time, my loosely supported descriptions led others to do controlled trials that confirmed the phenomenon. But doctors hadn't waited for those controlled trials. In advance, the better-than-well hypothesis had served as a tentative fact. Treating depression, colleagues looked out for personality change, even aimed for it, even though this wasn't my intended outcome. This brings me to my next point. Often, the knowledge that informs clinical decisions emerges when you stand back from it, like an impressionist painting. What initially seems like randomly scattered information begins to come together, and what you see is the bigger picture. That's where the true worth of anecdote lies, beyond its role as illustration hypothesis builder and low-level guidance for practice, storytelling can act as a modest counterbalance to a narrow focus on data. If we rely solely on evidence, we risk moving toward a monoculture, whereby patients and their afflictions become reduced to inanimate objects, a result I'd consider unfortunate, since there are many ways to influence people for the better. It's been my hope that, while we wait for conclusive science, stories will preserve diversity in our theories of mind. My recent reading of outcome trials of antidepressants has strengthened my suspicion that the line between research and storytelling can be fuzzy. In medicine, randomised trials are rarely large enough to provide guidance on their own. Statisticians amalgamate many studies through a technique called meta-analysis. The first step of the process, deciding which data to include, colours the findings. Effectively, the numbers are narrative. Put simply, evidence-based medicine is judgement-based medicine, in which randomised trials are carefully assessed and given their due. I don't think we need to be embarrassed about this. Our substantial formal findings require integration. The danger is in pretending otherwise. I've long felt isolated in embracing the use of narratives in medicine, which is why I warm to the likelihood of narratives being used to inform future medical judgments. It would be unfortunate if medicine moved fully to squeeze the art out of its science by marginalising the narrative. Stories aren't just better at capturing the bigger picture, but the smaller picture too. I'm thinking of the article about the depressed man given the drug Zoloft. The degree of transformation in the patient was just as impressive as the length of observation. No formal research can offer a 40-year lead-in or a 19-year follow-up. Few studies report on both symptoms and social progress. Research reduces information about many people. Narratives retain the texture of life in all its forms. We need storytelling, which is why I'll keep harping on about it until the message gets through. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.